back at it. All right, so today we're going to start up on our tour of ophthalmic pathology again with cornea. But first, we have to go back to Vienna. So this is the palace where the Austria-Hungria Empire was centered and where the emperor used to live. And of course, your obligatory you know, heroic emperor on a horse. You know, I can't imagine emperors usually on horseback leading armies, but in any event, it makes for a good heroic soldier. There's the close-up. I can't remember who that was. So it was one of the, one of the great emperors. And this is the, um, pretty much the seat of the old Austria-Hungary government. Now, what was interesting is the one time I was there previously, this was the uh, Sissi exhibit. And basically, Franz Josef, who was, you know, the elderly emperor, you know, they married him off to a princess from another country who was probably 40 years his younger, and Sissy decided she didn't want to hang around the, the, with the emperor, so she built several palaces all over, and that was pretty boring. And then she decided she wanted adventure and kind of went to different countries and, and you know, for adventure. Unfortunately, uh, when she was visiting one of these countries, an Italian anarchist figured out she was there and assassinated her, sadly. But in any event, they put together a nice, um, you know, a nice exhibit of, of the things that she gathered when she was the emperor's wife. And so as, as you're going through, you can see, you know, these aren't exactly, you know, plastic dinner plates. You know, and so a lot of, a lot of gold. Gold was the theme, and so a lot of gold. You know, it's great being king because, you know, you can pretty much do what you want. And so um, they had this really elaborate um, works made up for her. And here again, just, you know, some little little baubles uh, made of gold. So we'll, we'll kind of go through some of the little baubles that we had. I just thought it was interesting what, you know, kings live well. All right, so we're going to talk about cornea. So since you're in the hot seat, you get to go ahead and sort us off. So tell us about the layers of the cornea, starting from anterior to from external to internal. So bonus, bonus question, what stain is this? Is this a trifling stain? Or is this just an H&E? Third time's a charm. I don't know. This is actually a PAS stain. And the way you can tell, it's very subtle, but look at the epithelial basement membrane staining there, and not Bowman's layer. Look at the dark staining of the decimase membrane. So, Again, as you stated, Bowman's layer is not a basement membrane, decimates membrane is. So there's a difference in, in how they stain. All right, so Chris, since you joined us here, tell us about the <laughs> epithelium. <coughs> tell me about corneal epithelium. So epithelium is a stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium, um, typically about five to seven layers thick. Yeah, what else? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how corneal abrasions repair themselves. Um, so you've abraded that epithelium. How does it repair? Yeah, so we have, um, so we have uh, limbal stem cells that can help regenerate epithelial cells. Yeah. But actually, epithelial cells themselves, even in the center, can regenerate. So if you've got a focal area of an abrasion, the epithelial cells alongside of it will kind of release from their basement membrane and slide over, and then other epithelial cells will grow in their place. And so it's a very rapid process. I mean, you know, if you see patients with a corneal abrasion, I mean, it'll heal in 24, 48 hours, so a very, very rapid process. The only problem is, is these will, will stop growing by kind of contact inhibition, and so if you let these cells get inside the eye, say you've got a you know, traumatic injury and, and these epithelial cells gain access to the inside of the eye, they'll grow like crazy. There's nothing to inhibit them. So these grow very, very, very rapidly. And then, of course, as we mentioned, Bowman's layer is an area of condensed stroma underlying the epithelium. And 
it is there congenitally. And so what's important to remember is Bowman's layer does not regenerate. So Bowman's layer is kind of a historical record of what's gone on. And so if you've had something happen that, that causes Bowman's layer to be damaged or to be lost, it does not regenerate. All right, and again, what kind of stain is this? The PAS. Stain. PAS. So you can see that the basement membrane of the epithelium is this line right here. Bowman's layer is not a basement membrane, so it does not stain with the PAS stain. All right, so what layer are we looking at now here, Brad? Um, this is the stromal layer of the cornea. All right, so we're looking at the stroma here. Tell me a little bit about the stroma. Um, it's pretty thick, it's around 500 cell layers thick. Um, it, no, about 500 microns. Microns, sorry. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think there's 500 cell layers. <laughs> 500 um, microns thick. I don't know, what would you look So at? The, the cells that are here in the stroma are these little keratocytes, and normally they're these little quiescent spindle-shaped cells, but if stimulated, keratocytes can become like fibroblasts. So if you have a traumatic injury to the cornea, the keratocytes can become like fibroblasts and they can heal that injury. The problem is, is when they heal that injury, they have irregular fibers of, of collagen, they can cause scarring. And what's interesting is these um, bands of this connective tissue go all the way limbus to limbus, so the cornea is incredibly strong. Once you break that, say you're doing a surgical procedure, a cornea transplant, or there's an injury, then even though it heals up, it's not nearly as strong. And so normally the keratocytes are quiescent, they're spindle shaped, they're not really doing anything, but given enough stimulation, they can become like fibroblasts and they can start laying down collagen. All right, so what are we looking at here? So decimase uh, membrane and then the endothelial cells. All right, so decimase membrane, we already mentioned that it is indeed a basement membrane. And so when you look at decimase membrane, if you were to look at it with electron microscopy, there is kind of a congenital element of decimase membrane. There's what we call an anterior banded layer, banded just as the way the collagen fibers are when you look at them with the EM. But then the posterior part of decimase membrane gets a little bit thicker throughout life because it's the basement membrane of the endothelial cell. So as life goes on, decimase membrane gets a little bit, a little bit thicker. Okay, Shrav, I see you hiding back there. Um, tell me about the endothelial cell layer, important layer in the cornea. So the endothelial cells, they have these tight junctions between them, um, they look cuboidal, um, and then if you look at like confocal hypophyte, you can see the hexagonal shape, um, they don't regenerate after they're lost. So they're, they're almost hexagonal in shape when you look at them, and interestingly enough, in three dimensions, whenever you have cells that are covering a dome, they take on what's called a geodesic dome configuration, and that's just nature's way of, of covering a curved surface. And so they're hexagonal and they link together almost like a geodesic dome does. There are tight junctions between them and that helps to keep the aqueous fluid from just pouring into the stroma. And so there is some active transport going on there. There's some nutrients coming from the aqueous into the cornea. They're drawing some fluid off from the cornea. Now, they don't regenerate at least in, in primates. Um, in non-primates, for example, rabbits, rabbits aren't a good model to look at the effect of something on endothelium because they'll regenerate it. I mean, you can um, really damage rabbits, you know, endothelium really extensively, like doing phaco and other things, yet they will regenerate more humans, they don't, although people are now looking at getting ways to get endothelium to regenerate. And so it's not a hard and fast rule. There may be some ways, and Dr. Kinoshita in Japan is actually looking at rural kinase inhibitors to see if they could stimulate endothelial cells to grow, and so that, that's a potential in the future. All right, so any questions on just the normal anatomy of the cornea? All right, Catherine, what are we looking at right here? Uh, this is an external photograph um, of the left eye, and you can see there's some um, deposition, looks like, on the um, from the, is something from the limbus, kind of in the middle of the eye, of the what could that be? Um, the calcium deposition. All right, and what do we call this condition? Band-keratopathy. Band-keratopathy. So it's well named because it looks like a band. It's within the palpebral fissures, you know, where the lid covers it. For some reason, you don't get the deposition of the, of the calcium. And so it's here within the palpebral fissures. It'll start 
at the limbus and then it'll move centrally from there. What causes this? Exactly. So it's really a nonspecific sign of inflammation. And when we look at the look at this a little bit closer, here's a bonus question. Here's the calcium here. What are these little kind of dark spots? What are these little holes here? That would be where the nerves uh, travel and exit. Exactly. And so as the nerves come up, they pop through Bowman's layer and then they spread underneath the uh, epithelial layer there, and so where they do, the calcium doesn't get deposited, so it leaves these empty spaces. All right, uh, Tina, what stain do we use to stain calcium? So, um, the alizarin red. Okay, so you can see it's easy to remember because it stains it red. Now, I put this sideways just because I really wanted to highlight that. So here's the epithelium up here and here is the calcium. Well, where does the calcium usually lie when you've got band keratopathy? Looks like it's just below the epithelium. Even more specific? Um, sub Bowman's layer. Or, or Bowman's layer. even in Bowman's yeah. layer, exactly. So you get deposition of calcium along Bowman's layer underneath the epithelium yeah. and you get this extensive calcification. Now, here's epithelium. What is this stuff in between here? Sorry, can you point it? is dying here. Okay, there you can see it from here to here between epithelium and Bowman's where the calcium is. What is this material in here? Would that be just sort of scarring or? Oh, okay. There's a different aspect of it. So oftentimes you don't see just band keratopathy by itself. When you've got chronic inflammation, what else can you see? Panis. All right, so panis is material growing in again from the limbus between the epithelium and Bowman's layer. And you can have a fibrous panis, you can have fibroblast <coughs> cells here, you can have a fibrovascular panis, you can have vessels in it, you can even have an inflammatory panis. Panis and band keratopathy often run together because they're both signs of just chronic inflammation of some kind. And so just signs of just chronic inflammation. So this is a vascular type of panis. And here we've got a more fibrous type of panis, but again, it's got band keratopathy with it. There's the calcium along Bowman's layer. There's the epithelium. It runs in between. You even get calcification here. So band keratopathy, panis often run together, signs of chronic, chronic inflammation. Okay. I I'm sorry, I don't know you. I'm Austin, I'm a third year med student. All right, med students don't get pimps, so you're, you're lucky. <laughs> Caleb. So external photograph uh, of the, looks like the right eye. Um, and there's a clear zone at the limbus, and then there's this opacity. It's kind of in a circular shape. So what do we call that? Uh, Arcus senilis. Arcus senilis, and what does that signify? What causes that? Um, it's a uh, lipid deposition in the stroma. Okay. So as we look right here, we've got, you can see here's the stroma here, and here's the deposition of lipid. Now, what kind of stain is this? And what do we have to do to get that stain? Fresh tissue. So if you want to stain for lipid, you've got to have fresh tissue. You freeze it and stain it, and this is oil red O because it stains oil red with these little O's. It's oil red O. Interestingly enough, the deposition, we think it's some kind of a diffusion pattern. Because whenever you see a slight clear zone and then the deposited material, it usually means it's, it's diffusing from the limbus somehow. And so you can see, and it's also kind of shaped like an hourglass in that there is more lipid anterior in the stroma here and more lipid posteriorly, and then it thins out in the center. So you get that idea that it's kind of an hourglass shape. What does this signify? Um, it doesn't necessarily signify. Finding. Exactly. And so if you look at people, like when you guys are at the VA, anybody over the age of 70 has an arcus. And so we used to be taught that this meant they had d diseases with, you know, lipid problems, you know, hypercholesterolemia and other problems. It turns out it's really not the case. Although you can get deposition in people with high cholesterol, it doesn't necessarily mean that this patient has high cholesterol. All right. So I'm sorry. Again, you are... Michael. And you are... Okay, all right. Well, you can answer this then. 
<coughs> what are you seeing here? This is an external photograph uh, using sodium fluorescein to stain the cornea. You see a dendrite on the view. All right, so when you see dendritic staining like that, what do you think of? Uh, herpes simplex. Exactly. So this is your classic herpes simplex dendrite. And so you see that it's got staining of fluorescein in the center. What does the fluorescein staining mean? Uh, it's the, that there's a break in the epithelium. Exactly, so it means the epithelium is denuded in that focal area because then the fluorescein stain takes it up. So you can see that you've got denuded epithelium here and then you've got these little bulbous outpouchings coming off here. And that's very common when you see the herpes and this is usually herpes simplex one, but what do I always tell you guys to say? Could be two. Okay, so if you take anything away from this cornea lecture, if any attending shows you any picture of a cornea and they say, what's the differential? And you're not sure what it is. You say, well, of course, herpes is on the differential. So you just say that offhandedly. Well, of course, herpes. And then the attending will go, well, yeah, I guess, because herpes does everything. <coughs> and then they say, well, which one? You say, well, likely one, but could be two. Okay, so these are pearls now. You gotta remember these now if you're not sure what's going on. <coughs> All right, so we look at the, the pathology here and what you'll see in these cases is that the epithelium will be denuded in the center and then if you're gonna look for the infection, if you're gonna do a scraping and try to do some you know, um, special stains or cultures for herpes, you wanna be at the edge of that, not in the center because the center's the denuded epithelium here and then you've got uh, a small lymphocytic infiltrate. Now the problem with herpes is you can also get stromal herpes and we're gonna have the, um, you know, the cornea people will talk to you about these at length because these are the difficult ones to treat but you can get a herpes that'll be involved in the stroma and then you'll get this deeper, almost an immune type reaction because you can get with stromal herpes, you get an immune type reaction and you'll even get giant cells here posteriorly by decimase membrane. And so you can get an immune reaction, stromal herpes, which is different than just the simple epithelial herpes. And this is just showing you a close up. When you get herpes, you get these inclusion bodies in the cells. So I'm sorry, this is a scraping that we tried to stain, but you get these little inclusion bodies here in the nucleus with herpes. So now that we've got you know, you can do the um, stains that, that we've got now that, that, you know, will tell you for sure if it's herpes. Before we had those, you had to scrape them and then look under the microscope and try to figure out if that was herpes or not. All right, what do we see in here? Uh, so we got an external photograph of, I'm guessing, the left, left eye uh, with a lot of corneal edema and there's lots of, I guess, white white thinning of the cornea. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, extreme injection of the conge. So what would you be worried about here? So I'd be worried about like an infectious keratitis. Exactly, so this is a corneal ulcer and this patient would, would you know, wearing contact lenses. And unfortunately, you know, you know, if you've seen people all the time, I see them driving on foothill where the, the, you'll see this and they go, <laughs> so I just want to just honk and go down. <laughs> but um, so, you know, unfortunately, if you don't take care of your contacts or you overwear them, you know, the epithelium breaks down, bacteria start to live on the contacts, and then they can get into the eye. A bacterial corneal ulcer is one of our true ophthalmic emergencies. Because remember, we talked about the body's immune system. So a bacterial ulcer stimulates an acute inflammatory reaction, PMNs, and so, you know, PMNs have granules that, um, you know, deposit, you know, release materials that try to kill the bacteria. And those materials are great when you want to kill a bacteria, but they're not great in the, you know, stroma of, a, of the cornea. So you can get a tremendous amount of damage. You can get melting. They put out proteases, collagenases. And so this is a true emergency. You want to kill that bacteria as soon as possible before the body's immune system kills off that cornea. And so we look at a, at a close up here and you can see that here is a cornea, this indeed perforated, which is how I got the pathology, but you can see that there's this acute inflammatory cell reaction. And remember the corneas we looked at were that nice healthy pink color. When you look at this now, it's white. This is a melted cornea. That stroma can melt and, and an aggressive bacteria such as like a pseudomonas bacteria themselves that put out 
collaginations and things, you can melt a cornea and lead to perforation in 48 hours. So these are truly an ophthalmic emergency. And there's a close-up showing you these PMNs here, this acute inflammatory cell reaction. So again, they're good at killing bacteria. They're not so good in the cornea. So you want to take care of those immediately. Fortified antibiotics every hour. You want to watch them very, very carefully. Make sure that you don't get a perforation. All right, what are we seeing right here? I'm like, yeah, so similarly, uh, external color photograph, left eye, and again, a lot of hemorrhagic chemosis, and then it looks like there's a central um, opacity, likely another corneal ulcer. All right, so history on this is this is an old farmer from Idaho, and finally his wife makes him come in because, and this is true, his, his history is I've got some, well, my eye's a little blurry. How long's that been going on? Oh, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, I don't know, it's been going on. Well, you had any exposure to any vegetative material? And then he kind of looks at you like, well, duh, I'm a farmer. <laughs> and so evidently he was out, you know, thrashing crops or something or other, what farmers do, and got something in his eye about three weeks ago. And then finally they dragged him down to, to take a look. What do you think this could be? Could be a fungal character. All right, so when you see a more indolent ulcer, you think fungus, and so especially if there's a history of vegetative exposure, oftentimes you'll see fungus. And what stain do we do for fungi? Uh, the GMS stain. GMS, which stands for? Uh, Gamori methamine silver. Silver, so it, it kind of stains the, the hyphae here, this silvery black stain. And so fungal keratitis tends to be more indolent, vegetative exposure. All right, we're coming back around the corner here. Uh, so here we see an external photo. Um, looks like the epithelium is denuded kind of there in the center, and it's just very hazy. And um, looks like there's a little bit around there as well. So this would also make me think about an infectious uh, keratitis as well. Yeah, this has a few signs that would tell you what infectious keratitis this would be. Um. So you've got a chronic kind of non-healing corneal ulcer and you've got this ring infiltrate, and eye hurts. Yeah, so ring infiltrates make you think about like acanthamoeba. Okay, so this is a classic acanthamoeba. So this is a classic acanthamoeba. You'll often get a non-healing corneal ulcer. The problem is, is these will often be um, thought of as, as a herpes, and so they'll be treated for you know, a certain period of time before we finally realize what they are. So this is a classic appearance of acanthamoeba. How do we usually catch these? Yeah, how do you get them? Oh, uh, contact lenses. Yeah, so contact lens is the most common culprit, but you know, these things live in the ground, they live in warm water. Hot tubs have been a source of these, and so if you're in a hot tub, don't put your face in it. You know, <laughs> put your face out of the hot tub. And so these, these will grow in hot tubs and all, but it could be a contaminated contact lens case. We, get them. we had a young guy who was the worst case I'd ever seen, and he was a wrestler. And so I don't know if you guys remember from high school wrestlers. Those were the guys who would take their sweats and hang them up, and then the next day they'd just be standing up. They'd wash them like once a month, you know. And so this guy had never, you know, take care of his contacts. We looked at his contact lens case, and there was like stuff growing out of it. <laughs> and we literally stained for acanthamoebas. And so he got it from his contacts. The problem is, is these can invade into the nerves. They can go from the cornea into the sclera. These can be very, very difficult to treat. And what's the special stain we use to stain for this? Uh, and I hardly remember all these things. This is a gridley stain. Mm -hmm. And so the gridley stain will stain the stroma green, and here you see the cyst of the acanthamoeba. And the reason these are so hard to treat is they tend to insist. And so medicine can't get in them. And so, Interestingly enough, the most common treatment that we use that's most successful is actually swimming pool disinfectant because that will kill, you know, get into these cysts and kill them. It takes weeks to, to get rid of it. There's another uh, medication called broline, propamidine. You have, I don't know if it's even approved in the U.S. We used to have to order it from England and they'd send it over. Um, you know, sometimes polymyxin can, can affect this a little bit, but mostly it's the swimming pool disinfectant that kills these off. But you want to recognize these early. Because once they've spread, these are very difficult to treat. And you know, cornea transplants you do, and they can recur from the, you know, cornea scleral side. So very, very difficult to treat. And here's just an EM, kind of showing you this 
triple walled cyst, which is why these are really, really difficult to treat. All right, uh, Teresa, what do we see in here? Um, so, you can Rachel. see. Yeah, I'm sure. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Teresa laughed. <laughs> Rachel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, Teresa was leaving, so I got it. You can see there are some um, epithelial changes in this cornea. Um, in particular, there are areas uh, like little um, well demarcated uh, regions that have um, like a like a map like geographic. Yeah, almost kind of a, a, a pattern here where you've got some, you know, changes here in the epithelium. What do you think that could be? It can be something like an epithelial um, membrane, base membrane dystrophy. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of segue a little bit into some of the corneal dystrophies. And there are all kinds of corneal dystrophies, but the way I like to do them, again, I'm kind of a splitter. I like to put little mailboxes, individual ones. And so when we start thinking about anterior, we can think of anterior, and the most anterior is epithelial, epithelial basement membrane dystrophies. And so when these occur, you see this classic kind of picture. It's, it's, it's like a map. It's like a fingerprint. And this is kind of to show you what it looks like. And so this is the light trying to show you the little fingerprint lines. And so when you have an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, you get thickening irregularly the epithelial basement membrane. It can look like fingerprints. It can look like a map. It can even look like little dots. And so you literally call this map, you know, dot fingerprint, you know, and you can even abbreviate it, you know, map MDF, you know, MDF dystrophy. And you want to watch for these very carefully because what's the problem with these? I mean, they really don't give you that much vision effect, but what's the problem with them? You can get like recurrent corneal erosions. Exactly. So you get recurrent corneal erosions from these. And so the problem is, is that that basement membrane doesn't really work like it should and the epithelium doesn't stick down so these people can get recurrent erosions. You really want to not miss these before you do cataract surgery because again if you didn't notice it ahead of time and you do a cataract surgery and then people are getting recurrent erosions and irregular epithelium, you cause that. So that's the key thing you got to remember. Recognize everything ahead of time because if not your surgery caused it in the patient's mind. And so. Same thing with like even epiretinal membranes and things like that. Look very carefully in someone that you operate on because if you didn't see it pre-op and you see it post-op, you caused it. It's your fault. So here you can see again, map, dot. <coughs> this is the dot and the map and the fingerprint. So corneal epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. And here you can see this is again a fellow took this so because it's out of focus. <laughs> Not even getting Caleb sitting back there going, no, I didn't. <laughs> but you can see sometimes what will happen is, is they'll get a little erosion partial, and then it'll heal, and then another erosion, and then it'll heal. And so you'll get this multi-stacked, almost looks like stack of pancakes of epithelium <clears throat> with this thickened irregular basement membrane in between. So map dot fingerprint dystrophy. And this just shows you what happens with one of these when you do like a scraping to try to get it to reheal. <coughs> Look at how thick the basement membrane is. This is epithelium. This is all basement membrane. With what kind of stain? Rachel? I'm just be guessing. PAS. Okay. okay, so epithelium, so remember, basement membrane stains PAS. Easy one to remember, PAS. So you can see that this massively thickened epithelial basement membrane. There's a close-up. Okay, now we start to get into the, I call these the weird ones. And so there are more corneal dystrophies. Some people will call these Bowman's layer dystrophies, you know, subepithelial dystrophies. There are so many of these that you're going to have to memorize them for the boards. But I just want to show you a few just classic ones. And so if, if we look at, at this one, Brad, what, what do we see in here when you're looking at the slit lamp? Um, so it looks like more like cystic types of structures, um, and it looks as though I mean this is a hard picture. Is that in, this is in the cornea stroma? It's in right? the cornea. It's really anterior. It's yeah. kind of under the epithelium, anterior yeah. stroma. So it's a little bit more localized cystic structures within the epithelium. So what would you start thinking of here, um, like Meesmans. Exactly. So this is a classic picture of like Meesmans. Dystrophy, and, and what's interesting about Meesmans is they some some pathologists I can't remember who call this stuff peculiar substance, and it stuck. 
So it's literally, this stuff is called peculiar substance. And some people will say it's an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Some will say it's a Bowman's dystrophy. And you can see right here, you've got some thickened basement membrane. You've got these little kind of round um, structures that are in here. So when you see these multiple dots underneath there, this is called Miesmann's dystrophy. And it's characterized by deposition of peculiar substance. So interesting stuff. Is that a PAS stain? Is it PAS That's a PAS positive? stain, yep, it's PAS positive, yep. But it's got some other characteristics to it that aren't just normal basement membranes. So it's, it's really is peculiar stuff. All right, so what are we looking at here, Shrav? Um, it's like a silent photo of the cornea again, and um, it's hard to tell what, what layer there. Yeah, I'm kind of showing the, the broad beam, and I'm sorry, it's not a great picture, but you've got kind of this irregular, whitish, grayish stuff. Again, it's anterior stroma, Bowman's layer around there, but diffuse kind of scallops sometimes. Since it's more diffuse, I'd probably think macular dystrophy if it's in the stroma. Okay, let's say it's more superficial than that. It's not quite in the stroma yet. It's really anterior, almost, you know, again, Bowman's layer, subepithelial. So there's another dystrophy you guys will have to memorize for boards called, called Reese-Buchler. And so Reese-Buchler dystrophy, is, is, it's kind of got two different, you know, ones. It's a type 1 and a type 2. And basically it's, again, an anterior type of dystrophy. And when you look at it, you'll see that Bowman's layer will be disturbed. So it's not so much epithelial basement membrane, but it's Bowman's layer is disturbed. It's absent. You'll get some focal irregular scarring in, in that area. All right, so now we want to spend a little bit of time talking about corneal stromal dystrophies. And there was a mnemonic put together, and I heard this when I was even a pre-residency fellow. I don't know who first invented this, but it's been passed down through the ages. And so, you know, get out your little pens if you haven't written this down. So the mnemonic is Marilyn Monroe really always gets her man L.A., California. All right, so Catherine, M, Maryland. Um, I think it stands for macular dystrophy. Macular dystrophy. And so what does macular dystrophy look like? This little collage of some different macular dystrophies. Um, it'll be more central, I believe. Okay. More central, kind of some clear areas in the periphery. <clears throat> depositions of um, mucopolysaccharide. Okay, so you look at the depositions here, and the key thing when you look at them, the spaces in between are not clear. So you'll see there'll be some haziness even in between the area of the deposits. So Marilyn Macular Monroe mucopolysaccharide really... Um, really... are... really is recessive. recessive. And so easy to remember because this is the only one that's recessive. That's why we toss it in. The rest of these are dominant. So the other two are dominant. This is recessive. Okay. Always. Um, is that Alshin blue? Alshin blue. And here's the Alshin blue stain. And so Alshin blue stains the mucopolysaccharide here in the stroma blue. So it's easy to remember. And so here you see, so the reason this mnemonic is good is it tells you what it's called, what the material is, and what the stain is. And so that's why it's a really valuable mnemonic. These are always on board somewhere because it's just, it's mindless memorization, which is what boards are made to test. So, so you can see Alshin blue, and you've got the staining of the mucopolysaccharides here in the stroma. All right, here's again an Alshin blue. Tina. Gets. This would be granular dystrophy. Granular. Now, the granular, if you'll notice, a little bit different than the macular. The granular is these individual, I call them almost like cookie crumbs. But the key is you see that the space in between them is clear, and there's a clear zone here out to the limbus. So this is granular. Her. A uh, hyaline. Hyaline. 
Okay, there's a retro illumination. Uh, man, we saw in trichrome. So you can see the hyaline is here in the really in the anterior stroma in the Masson's trichrome. The trichrome stains collagen, connective tissue blue. It stains the um, hyaluronic acid. It stains it red. Okay. Ah, oh, you're back. Sorry, I called Rachel Teresa. My, my apologies. I don't know who I've offended more, but probably offended both of you guys. But okay. <laughs> Didn't have to tell her. <laughs> okay. L. Lattice. Lattice. All right. And so you see lattice is well named. It looks like a little lattice work, you know, kind of the rose bushes growing. So you've got these little lattice lines all over the place. Okay. A. So, hey, now remember, the second one is always the stuff that's in there. So, what is this stuff? It's amyloid. So, A is for amyloid. LA, and then California, the stain. Oh, it's um, Congo red. Congo red. Now, I always say it's a misnomer. I mean, that doesn't look red to me. It's kind of burnt orange. But in any event, Congo red stains amyloid, you know, red, if you will, kind of a red stain. And so that's the way you remember these. Now, there's something really cool about amyloid and, that, and with a Congo red stain, and that is? Polarization. Exactly. So if you put two polarized filters on and cross them, the amyloid lights up. So this is an actual cornea, and we've cross-polarized them and taken a picture. And all these areas where it's lighting up bright are where the amyloid deposition is. And so you can get uh, lighting up with cross polarization with them. Um, so, Marilyn Monroe really macular mucopolysaccharide recessive gets granular her hyaline man massage trichrome L lattice A amyloid California Congo red. So, that's why you always remember the corneal stromal dystrophies. Okay. All right, um, Kayla. Yeah, what are we seeing here? External photograph of the left eye. There's some opacity. It looks like some vascularity um, in the in the cornea. Um, I can't tell how deep it is on this view, but it's just kind of a diffuse kind of a haziness. Yeah, and this is an unfair picture because I look at that, you can't tell what this is. This could have been, who knows, a chemical injury, this could have been God knows what. But believe it or not, here we do a Congo red stain and we cross polarize so it lights up. Jeez. So you can also get amyloidosis affecting the cornea without lattice. And so systemic amyloidosis sometimes will you know, there's a systemic type of amyloidosis that does not affect the cornea, but there's a systemic type of amyloidosis that does affect the cornea. So very uncommon, but you can get deposition of amyloid. And again, here's Congo red. Here's all of this amyloid throughout the cornea, and there it is lighting up when we do cross polarization. So remember, even systemic amyloid can affect the, uh, the cornea. All right, what are we looking at here? External photograph. Centrally of the cornea is a little bit hazy, and then up in the right corner, there's some vasculature extending out of the cornea. And this first cell, but layered, is based on this. All right, so this I was trying to show you is, is kind of deeper cornea. So this is really deep, and if you look at the pattern, you see all kinds of little irregular, people call this a, a you know, a, a beaten metal look. Yeah, so this is Fuchs dystrophy. And so, you know, by beaten metal, what I mean is, I don't know if you guys, you know, in, in the olden days, back in less enlightened times, in, you know, junior high, boys took shop and girls took home ec. And I don't, I, I don't make this up, you know. And so in shop, you worked with metal. And so some of the, you know, less studious of the students in the metal shop used to love getting the, you know, the shop teacher really upset because you take a ball-peen hammer and you take his smooth metal and just hammer the hell out of it. And so a ball-peen hammer is a rounded hammer. And so a beaten metal look, if you take a rounded hammer and you ping a thin piece of metal, it gives you this little look. And so this is what Fuchs dystrophy looks like. 
and so it's got that beaten metal appearance to it. If you do retroillumination, you see these little dots, um, you know, coming coming out at you. And so this now we've worked our way deeper. Now this is there's a whole bunch of, of dystrophies of decimase, and and I'm not going to show you all those because we could do a whole hour on those. But this is the most common one, and this is a posterior dystrophy. This is called an endothelial dystrophy. So Fuchs dystrophy is an endothelial dystrophy. What causes those little dots? What's the path equivalent? It's, the, it's an inherited, uh, also type 4 collagen. Well, it is, but what are they actually? What, what are the little missing pieces of endothelium? Okay, they're missing pieces of endothelium, but there's more than just that. There's actually little deposits that form that are called guttata. And so what you're seeing is you're actually seeing those abnormal endothelial cells start to lay down more decimase membrane. And if you look at this, look at decimase membrane here. That's like four times normal thickness. So Fuchs dystrophy, you can get a markedly thickened decimase membrane, but you get irregular deposits of basement membrane material. These are called guttata. And then the endothelial cells eventually die off. You know, it's an inherited dystrophy. We're now finding a lot about what the actual enzymatic defect is that causes this. But um, the problem with Fuchs dystrophy is you eventually get endothelial cells damaged, they get knocked off, and then you'll get corneal edema. And that's why you eventually need to do surgical. Now, we used to do cornea transplants for these, but now you'll do a DSEC or DMEC. You just need to replace the endothelium. So these are called guttata. It's deposition of this abnormal basement membrane material. And then you can even get thick decimase membrane. Now, there is a condition called guttata less fuchs where you get thick decimase membrane, uh, but you really don't get you know, deposits that you can recognize. And this is interesting because only department chairman corneal attendings can see guttata less fuchs at the slit lab. It's, it's the S1 murmur. You know, I don't know if you ever remember your cardiology attending would have that S1 murmur, and it, you, you never hear it. It doesn't exist, but <laughs> the attending could, could hear it. And, and Guttatilus Fuchs, only, you know, chairman corneal attendings can see it. Mere mortals cannot. But there is, you know, an entity where you just get more of a smooth deposition of decimase membrane rather than lumpy bumpy. And so Fuchs dystrophy. All right, what do we see in here? We got a... Uh man looking down on both eyes uh, and you can see that the corneas are especially the right one is protruding uh, and most likely keratoconus okay uh, so what do they call this for bonus points the, uh, something sign Munson <laughs> <laughs> sign Munson sign now this is a really crude way of diagnosing keratoconus and so this is a severe Cone. I mean, obviously, we have more sophisticated ways. We look at corneal topography, and you know, severe keratoconus like this isn't the difficult thing to diagnose. It's the subtle, or what they call the form frust keratoconus, that's hard to, to diagnose. And you really want to make sure before you do a LASIK procedure on somebody who's a myop with some irregular astigmatism, make sure they don't have keratoconus because you can actually really cause some ectatic problems in the cornea if you do. But this is a severe keratoconus called Munson sign. The patient looks down and you literally see the cone-shaped outpouching of the cornea. All right, so we look at the pathology. Mike, what's the pathology here of, of the keratoconus? Um, so it looks like there's a, a focal break there in uh, Bowman's layer. Exactly, so you get a little focal break here in Bowman's layer. So some would argue this is a Bowman's dystrophy. You know, so you can argue back and forth, but you get these focal discontinuities, your breaks in Bowman's layer. Okay, central cornea. What do you? What is the thickness of the central cornea? About uh, 600 microns. Well, I mean, in the keratoconus. Oh, uh, so it'll be much thinner. So it's more thin, thin yeah. exactly. So keratoconus is characterized by progressive thinning of the stroma in the center of the cornea or inferior center, also thinning of the epithelium. So when you look at the path, the epithelium may only be three or four cell layers thick instead of six. The stroma will be diffusely thin, and then you get these focal discontinuities in Bowman's layer, and that's classic keratoconus. That's the pathology of keratoconus. All right, so Chris, we're, I'll give you a hint. This person has keratoconus. They come in with sudden visual loss. Uh, so here we see an external photo of the eye. Um, 
Mm-hmm. It's like there's these um, uh, kind of regular areas of, of kind of darkness. This makes me kind of just a beaten irregular appearance. Um, so it kind of makes me think about um, uh, so areas of thinning. So in keratoconus, we can see bullet formation and those kind of things. So that would make me think maybe what this is. What exactly do we call this? So a patient with keratoconus, they're going along fine. They wake up one morning and their vision's totally blurry. And if you look at the beam, that cornea is actually really thick rather than really thin. And these irregular kind of foldings here, indicative of edema. Um, so, like both keratopathy, or? Yeah, there's a specific entity that affects keratoconus that can cause this. I guess I don't know. Rachel. Hydrops, exactly. What is hydrops? Well, it actually, it's not in, in Bowman's that the breaks are, it's actually in Decimates. And so my simplistic way of thinking about it is, is that cone is pooching out, it's pooching out, the cornea is thinning, 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 thinning. You know, Decimates is, is kind of collagenous, but it's also elastic, and then Decimates just breaks. And so because it breaks, fluid just gushes from the anterior chamber into the cornea itself, and you get this acute corneal edema or thickening. And if you look at what the pathology looks like, this again is a PAS stain. Here is Decimase membrane, and look, there's a break there. And so Decimase membrane stretches, 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 then it breaks, and like a rubber band, it's got a little elasticity to it, the edges curl. And so they'll curl there, and then you'll get this acute corneal edema, so it'll rush in. Now, you don't necessarily have to do a corneal transplant urgently. Because eventually what can happen if you can get the patient through this is that those endothelial cells that are here, they won't, more of them won't form, but some of them will start to slide over and eventually they'll fill that gap, start making new decimase membrane and the cornea can sometimes detergest on its own. So you don't urgently have to do a cornea transplant in high drops. And there's a close up. Here's decimase membrane, you can see there's endothelial cells still on the inside surface of it as it's curled in. And so these endothelial cells can eventually slide over and fill that gap and this can go down. And so that's when you get acute edema in a patient with keratoconus, you know, acute loss of vision, think hydrops. All right, now there's another entity, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it, but I just wanted to show you this just to, so that you guys could always remember these. And um, so, Brad, I don't expect you to know what this is, but what is the stain that we stain for iron? Prussian. Prussian blue. So it stains iron blue. And how do we remember that? Um, something to do with metal and tanks and war. Exactly. So the Prussians, <laughs> the Prussians were the militarists that really welded together Germany and you know, helped us to have World War I and World War II. But, um, so, so, you know, Prussians think of, of metal and iron, and so Prussian blue stains for iron. And so remember now, you can have multiple iron stains of the cornea. And so there could be various ones. Now, let's say, since we're talking about keratoconus here anyway, this is a Prussian blue stain of a patient with keratoconus. What do we call the iron ring in keratoconus? Flesher. Fleischer ring. And Fleischer. So, Fleischer ring. And so kind of like the Kaiser Fleischer that you see with deposition of, of copper. But anytime you get pooling of tears, you can actually get deposition of iron in that area. So at the base of a cone, you can get what's called a Fleischer ring. You can even get right where your lids normally sit, some little subtle linear iron lines about a you know, third of the way up from the limbus on the inferior cornea. And those are called hudson stolly lines. You can even get iron lines at the head of a pterygium. You can get iron lines with a bleb that's, that's coming down. So you get iron lines from all kinds of things. But for keratoconus, you get what's called a Fleischer ring. All right, so Teresa, what are we looking at right here? What was that? Corneal button. Looks like it had a PK, and it's cut in half. And it's really thick and edematous and... Looks like there's some denuded epithelium in the center. All right, so this is a corneal button. It's been cut in half. The previous sutures here tell you that this patient has had a previous 
cornea transplant, PKP, it's very thick, it's white, it's opacified, and let's say this is what that looked like before we removed the cornea. What are we looking at here? So the epithelial layer is just um, coming off and there's Ebola, and then Bowman's layer is below. All right, so this is what we call bullous keratopathy. And what's important here is here's Bowman's layer, again, PAS stain. Look, here's the base membrane <coughs> down here. So edema percolates through the stroma. Now, when we process stroma, um, you know, during our regular histopathologic processing, it shrinks a little bit. So these little spaces here are not signs of edema. You don't judge edema by spaces in the stroma because, you know, that happens just from normal processing. But the fluid percolates up here, and then you get swelling of the epithelial cells, eventually the swelling will make these cells pop, and then you'll get a boli, a blister, with the basement membrane still down on Bowman's layer, and then this blister here. So this is called bullous keratopathy. And this can be caused by anything that affects which layer? It's the endothelium. So remember, the endothelium has tight junctions, and it's the endothelium that keeps the cornea detergents, keeps fluid from getting in there. So anything that affects the endothelium can cause corneal edema, which can cause bullous keratopathy. So this is what bullous keratopathy looks like. So this could be um, Fuchs dystrophy even. It could be damage from surgery when... You know, like Mike's in there with me with a 30,000 hertz ultrasound right under the endothelium, you know, killing off 10,000 cells at a time. Um, that could cause this too. Um, this is the most common reason why cornea transplants fail. You know, just the process of putting that, taking the graft off a donor, putting it on, putting sutures in it, you knock off 50% of the endothelial cells, so eventually those cells can, can you know, not function still and you'll get corneal edema. So, Bullous keratopathy is kind of an end stage of anything that can affect the corneal endothelium. Okay, so again, this is Sissy's porcelain that they had made up from China and sent over. So next week we're going to do lens. Okay, so read up on, on the crystalline lens, all of the various factors that can affect lens. Questions?